We are, as you know, in the middle of a study of the Gospel of Mark. We're in, I'm happy to report, the second chapter, finishing the second chapter today. So, lest anyone make sarcastic remarks about our pace. We are uh, in the middle of a series of stories which are commonly called the conflict stories. They follow chapter one where Jesus' authority is introduced to us in rather emphatic terms. And then in chapter two of, and chapter three, we begin to see that authority pitted against the religious authority of the time, corrupted. And so each of the stories tends to pinpoint some area where corrupt religious authority then and really throughout history has abused God's people, stealing from them their liberty and putting some new form of bondage in its place. And so that's the topic generally, and this morning we're coming to the fourth of these five stories, which has to do with the Sabbath. And so this week and also next week, we'll find both of these stories in some ways resolve around or revolve around the character of the Sabbath. We learn lessons here not only about the Jewish Sabbath that was being practiced at that time, but also maybe something broader about the Sabbath itself, and I hope we can tuck a little bit of that in as we go along. So our text is in Mark, beginning in uh, chapter 2, verse 23, and it is the story of Jesus going through the corn fields, the grain fields, eating on the Sabbath. And so that's the general theme. This is the Word of God. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? He said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So, the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Powerful words. Let's just pray and we'll take a look at this. Our Father, we're grateful that this one who you sent into this world is Lord. Lord of time, Lord of eternity, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord even of the Sabbath. And we pray that our brief reflection on this remarkable text would be guided by your Spirit, that we would be fair to its intended meaning, examining it with integrity and also the eyes of faith. And all of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are in the first half of Mark, the middle section, which is the largest and concerns Jesus' ministry in Galilee. We've seen his authority, as I said, chapter 1, now that authority in conflict, a kind of escalating conflict in each story. The tension is rising. The stakes are increasing as we go along with each of these stories. It seems that each story is pinpointing some point where corrupt religious authority is tempted to abuse its position. We've seen that through history. We've seen it in our own lifetime. We've seen it as recently as recent newspapers. Corrupt authority is tempted and often succumbs to the temptation of abusing that position of prestige for its own advantage and at the expense of those who were supposed to be under the care of that authority. Well, the same thing was happening in the first century. This morning we're finding the fourth of these where life becomes encrusted with all kinds of rules that become virtually impossible to obey. It's almost as bad as the IRS code. I just tell you, you cannot quite figure out how to obey every aspect of what is going on, and so that becomes the center, really, of the concern in this one and really next week's story as well, both of which have to do with the Jewish Sabbath. 
So Mark starts his discussion. Now it happened when he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. As they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. This is ramping up the concern. Last week, or last time, we were looking at fasting. Fasting was in some ways a practice that was embraced by those who were kind of the elite of the Jewish community, but there was no real expectation that everybody would necessarily participate. And so it was something more of an intramural debate, you might say, having to do with how people who really wanted to make the grade might live their lives. But now we come to something that applied much more broadly. This really had the force of civil law, really, the observance of the Sabbath, and the stakes are higher. This is really moving more to the center of what was distinct about the ancient Jewish culture. Jesus is in the grain fields. He's with his disciples. This is probably wheat or barley. Commentators suggest this was probably therefore taking place in the spring. The problem with what's going on here is not that Jesus and the disciples were picking. It's not theft that's in, involved. This is gleaning. And you know under the Old Testament, gleaning laws were part of a broader body of legislation called poor laws. These were laws specifically put in place to provide for the poor of the land. So if you were a landowner, you were required to leave a certain amount of grain unharvested around the periphery of your fields so that the poor could come in and get the benefit of that. And that was just one of the provisions, one of several, I might add, that was intended to care for the poor of the land. And so what Jesus and his disciples are doing was perfectly legal in terms of a gleaning kind of activity. The problem was they were doing it, of course, on the Sabbath. And to so do on the Sabbath suggested that they were involved in harvesting. And harvesting, of course, was prohibited on the Sabbath. And thus, even gleaning, which was a very modest form of harvesting, was seen as an infraction of that law. So that's what puts this issue before us. The whole question of the Jewish Sabbath, of course, is an incredibly important one. We see it showing up again and again in all the Gospels. I think sometimes we as believers separated 2,000 years from that culture may or may not fully appreciate all that was in play when these questions of Sabbath came up, but if we can kind of get ourselves back into the state of mind of people living at that time, the Jewish Sabbath was really a distinctive feature that set Israel apart in many ways from any other ancient culture. First of all, because it represented an idea of what's called sacred time. Now, every religion, without exception, has some idea of the sacred. Something is sacred in every religion, but it was rather rare for ancient religions to have a notion of sacred time. They'd have a sacred place, sacred objects, sacred people, but not routinely sacred time. This was a point where Israel was virtually unique in attaching such significance to a particular time of the week, the Sabbath. It was the preeminent, as you know, holy day of the Jewish calendar. It began on Friday night when three stars were available in the, or were visible in the sky, you see. That was your measure. And then it went for 24 hours to the same moment the following day, Saturday night. It was regarded generally by the Jewish people as their distinct, indeed something of their unique mark among the nations of the world. The Old Testament is peppered with various comments emphasizing the significance of the Sabbath. So, for example, Ezekiel chapter 20, Moreover, I also give them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. That they might know, that is, that Israel might know, but also that the surrounding nations might know. Israel was called a priestly nation. It was, as it were, the pastor nation to the other nations. It had the house of prayer for the nations. It was supposed to be distinguished by a higher level of life. There was no interest in the Israel community, nor in the Old Testament, of imposing the Sabbath on everybody else. 
This was a point where these people distinguished themselves as a kind of holy people, a holy nation, a pastor nation, if you will. And so it was kind of a signal, a flag that was waving over them to distinguish them in that way. The Midrash was a set of Jewish commentaries on the Old Testament that gives us a lot of insight into the way in which various rules in the Old Testament were construed. A Midrash says, quote, in his giving of the Sabbath, to whom may God be likened? To a king who had a precious object which he desired to have only his son possess. In like manner, the Holy One, blessed be he, desired to have only the children of Israel possess the rest and the holiness of the Sabbath day. This was something that belonged to them, and they took great pride in it, and though, thus it's not too surprising that we find a kind of body of legislation that begins to surround the Sabbath and how it's to be protected. The Sabbath was comprehensive. It not only applied to people, it applied to foreigners who were in the land, it applied to slaves. Usually slaves don't have a day off, but they took the day off, the Sabbath. It applied to animals. Animals took the day off. It even applied to plant life. You couldn't pick or harvest on the Sabbath. So it really did represent kind of stopping the clock, as it were, once a week on this special day. You know that the original announcement of the Sabbath law comes in the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, the fourth commandment, and in that lengthy commandment, the Sabbath is tied to creation. So we hear that God rested on the seventh day. It's the only command, therefore, that harkens back to the creation for its rationale. The Talmud taught, which was another set of commentaries, that anyone who observed the Sabbath became a partner with God in creation and brought salvation to the world. And so there was a rather rich, redemptive idea in the minds of people that as they observed the Sabbath, they were doing something good for everybody else. It was the Jewish belief that on account of honoring the Sabbath, the Israelites would inherit the world to come, the great age that they believed lay in their future, and they believed that that age would be entirely Sabbath. Now that's rather important for a point that is a little bit subtle, but I want to return to it if time permits toward the end, having to do with Hebrews chapter 4. You know the book of Hebrews was written to Jewish people in the first century who were in some ways wrestling with how to integrate their sometimes newly found Christian faith with their Jewish heritage, and one of the points at which there was a fair amount of confusion was how do we understand this Sabbath business? How do we carry a Sabbath idea into our Christian understanding? And Hebrews chapter 4 really does presuppose the backdrop that I've just suggested right here, that there is a time coming in which, in a sense, all time is Sabbath. And the writer to the Hebrews, in, in a sense, says, as we enter Christ, we enter that rest, which had never been realized by the people before Christ came. So a little bit of that Jewish backdrop actually helps us to understand Hebrews as well. Well, the Ten Commandments is restated 40 years later. We have it, first of all, in Exodus chapter 20. Then you know there's 40 years of wandering, and then just before the children of Israel enter the promised land under Joshua, Moses gives what's called the Deuteronomos, the second giving of the law. He restates the Ten Commandments in that book, but interestingly, the one commandment that changes slightly is the fourth commandment. So in Exodus, the fourth commandment is rooted in creation. In Deuteronomy, the fourth commandment is rooted in Exodus. And now there's a different rationale that's given, not that the first one was abrogated, but this is in a sense in addition to. And so we read in the Deuteronomy account that the rationale for the Sabbath was that the people of God had been in bondage, but now had been liberated. 
You are, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, you see. You had been slaves. And now I brought you out to a place of liberty. And in a sense, the signal that was going to stand for the liberation of God's people would be this remarkable, indeed unique practice, unheard of anywhere else in the ancient world, that they would just take a day off every week, you see. Because slaves don't take a day off. Slaves work seven days a week. They're machines. They don't stop. There's no special day. And now to prove, in a sense, that we are not slaves, to prove that we are liberated people, we are going to take a day off every week. The Sabbath is going to be the great sort of flashing neon sign. We are, no longer, we are free people. Now, the irony of the New Testament is that this which was supposed to be the emblem of liberty, the Sabbath, had probably become the most, the single most important expression of oppression and tyranny and totalitarianism to the Jewish people that they'd ever experienced. Because now the Sabbath had been so encrusted with arcane, pedantic rules that it almost became impossible for a person to make it through with a clear conscience. And so the Sabbath had been flipped on its head and turned into this instrument of abuse when in fact it was supposed to be precisely the opposite thing. And in some ways what we find in the controversies about the Sabbath and the career of Jesus is in some ways understood against that backdrop. So the Pharisees show up and they say, look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Of course, the whole questionnaire is what is lawful on the Sabbath? You know, that's what we're dealing with. And the Pharisees have a particular view that what Jesus and the disciples are doing is illegal by virtue of the rules that apply to the Sabbath. Well, the interesting thing about this whole question of what is lawful on the Sabbath is that even they didn't quite agree. Even in the Jewish community, there was a fair amount of debate among the rabbis some taking a more conservative, restrictive view, some taking a more liberal view, some more lenient, some less so. As far as we can tell, the most strict Sabbath code that was used in the ancient world was among the Essenes, which was a little insulated group, not too little, but they lived uh, sort of isolated from the rest of the community in the region of the Dead Sea in Qumran. They are the ones that left us, of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls. As we've surveyed those, we learned that they had a very, very highly structured approach to the Sabbath. So, for example, it was illegal to carry a child on the Sabbath. It was illegal to help an animal that was birthing on the Sabbath. It was illegal to retrieve an animal that had fallen into a pit on the Sabbath. That's interesting because Jesus raises that question, you may recall, later to the Pharisees. Which of you would not retrieve an animal from a pit? Almost as if he's you know, getting into that little debate between the Pharisees and the Essenes on that very point. Jesus at that point, of course, making a separate uh, point as well. The Mishnah, somewhat more liberal, nevertheless listed 39 classes of work that profane the Sabbath. These included, not surprisingly, plowing, hunting, butchering, but also included tying or loosing a knot, yes. sewing more than one stitch, writing more than one letter. That really does reduce your activity level, I'm going to tell you. It prohibited beginning a work prior to the Sabbath that might threaten to carry into the Sabbath. It prohibited doing any work on the Sabbath at all, unless it was truly a life-threatening situation. That was the one exception. Somebody's life had to be at risk, really, and then you could do work in that connection. The tradition of the elders was a body of casuistry, case law, usually set up as an if-then kind of arrangement, if this, then that, as a way of construing or interpreting the rules that applied to the Sabbath. The rabbis had actually attempted to come up with a precedent for every conceivable 
possible infraction of the Sabbath. So they had all of these various examples, cases that were applied. It did give rise to some rather novel rulings. For example, it was forbidden to set a dislocated foot or hand or shoulder on the Sabbath. It was illegal to repair a fallen roof, although you could prop it up temporarily. If a building collapsed, it was permitted for you to dig through the rubble for survivors. And if you found a survivor, you could rescue that person. But if all you found were dead bodies, you had to leave them till the next day. Well, that's a whole interesting conversation. If we had a lot more time and leisure, it'd be fun to look at some of those. But the one infraction that was alleged in this story has to do with gleaning, has to do with this business of harvesting. There's actually another infraction that could have been raised, and that was whether the disciples and Jesus had violated the rabbi's rule concerning a so-called Sabbath day's journey, you see. Sabbath day's journey was that you couldn't travel more than 2,000 cubits on the Sabbath day. A cubit was the distance from your elbow to the tip of your finger, so what, 18 inches or so? That'd be a little less than a half a mile. Well, I don't know how far this grain field was out of town, but it's possible that they had violated the Sabbath day's journey just to get there, but then, of course, the Pharisees were there too, so, you know, uh, maybe that's why they didn't raise it. But they do raise this question, why is it that they're, not, that they're doing what is not lawful in that they were reaping these ears of grain Again, it wasn't a problem of reaping in itself, of gleaning, that wasn't it, but they were doing it on the Sabbath. Commentators rather divide on the question, was this a sincerely motivated question or not? We do have some idea that on occasion, when Jesus is presented with a question, it actually is a sincerely motivated question. There were differences of opinion among the religious elite of the day, and it does seem on occasion they were trying to see whether Jesus would take this position or that, you know. And that may have been what was going on here, because there was some question about whether gleaning laws were within the scope of those rules. So it could have been simply asking Jesus his opinion in a fairly sincere way. We don't know. We do know that by next week, the last story in this series of five, all sincerity is gone. They are laying a trap for him. They're watching him like hawks. They're just looking for him to mess up in some way or another. And we hear at the end of the story, they were plotting his destruction. So by then, all bets are off, you know. But at this point, it could be that there was some sincer sincerity in the question itself. Either way, Jesus gives them this response. Have you never read what David did when he was hungry? He was in need and hungry. He and those who were with him. Just a little footnote, I think sometimes we read the New Testament and we hear Jesus say, have you never read? And we think that is a little bit more provocative than it really was. It's not Jesus isn't saying, you bunch of idiots, haven't you ever read your Bibles? I mean, you know, it, that's kind of the way we hear it sometimes, isn't it? Uh, you guys, you know, uh, you, you're supposed to be experts in the Bible, haven't you ever read it? That kind of thing. That's not it at all. This was a standard way in which the rabbis would introduce a teaching point. It would be comparable to our saying, is it not written in the book of, you know, the Psalms, that such or so? It's just simply setting up a sort of rhetorical question for purposes of giving its answer. And so the, the phrase, uh, have you never read, is really more, much more in that spirit. It would be comparable to saying, you know, let us be instructed on the following point. So Jesus is not slapping them in the face here. He's not abusing them or insulting them or anything of the sort. But he is invoking now a standard kind of rabbinic uh, sort of jargon. More important, of course, he's raising the question of David. This is the first time that David has been mentioned in the Gospel of Mark. It won't be the last. And of course, by the time we're done, we're going to see a pretty clear notion that Jesus, of course, is, among other things, the seed of David. Well, David, as you know, is the most revered of the Jewish kings. He was the man after God's own heart. He was the one who was most highly regarded, respected. Probably most importantly, from the Jewish point of view, he was the one with whom God had made what was called the Davidic Covenant. 
So in the Old Testament, you've got a variety of covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and so on. Even the New Covenant is mentioned to us in Jeremiah. And so seven altogether, including that one, are kind of linchpins, you might say, of the Old Testament revelation. Right in the middle of them is this one that's called the Davidic Covenant. David was at peace. He'd been able to put down you know, various threats from surrounding nations. And he's thinking to himself, well, this is the time. I'm going to build a house for God. He says that to Nathan. Nathan says, go for it. Then Nathan comes back after God clarified his thinking and says, look, David, you want to build a house for God, but actually God's going to build a house for you. And God is going to establish for you a dynasty. And you're never going to fail to have a descendant from you sitting on the throne of Israel, culminating in the one who will be called the seed of David. And this seed of David is going to rule over a kingdom without end. And of course, the New Testament regards Jesus par excellence now as the seed of David. And when Jesus now invokes David to respond, this is at least the first little hint by Mark of a theme that's going to become somewhat more dramatic later on. Jesus isn't just sort of casually mentioned David here, uh, you know, for purposes of an illustration. This is really a much more intentional idea, in Mark's uh, treatment of it at least, that Jesus is putting himself in that position of being the descendant of David, and he's invoking David as precedent, really, for what Jesus himself is going to announce in this particular conversation. So Jesus gives the following example. You're probably familiar with this story, how David went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests. And he also gave some to those who were with him. So this David is a wonderful story. If I ever survive teaching Mark, you know, I mean, that is to say if I finish it within my lifetime, then I'm thinking about after that doing David. I, that would be fun to go back to the Old Testament. So we'll see how that goes. But <clears throat> you know the story. David has now finally figured out without any particular ambiguity that Saul is out for his neck. David had been a, a wonderful servant of Saul, great, powerful warrior, widely respected. But of course, the envious Saul began to fear that the people were rallying more to David than even to himself, and that translated into a certain degree of paranoia that finally made it clear Saul was going to, uh, was going to do David in if he ever had an opportunity. And David, of course, being aware of this, runs for his life, and some loyal men go with him, and off they go, and they go to a location in Israel called Nob, N-O-B, which is where the tabernacle was. The temple hadn't yet been built. Solomon would do that some years later. Jerusalem had not even been taken yet. David would take Jerusalem at a later time. So now the tabernacle is in this location, the central sanctuary, the place of worship for the people of God at that time, was in this little place called Nob. And the high priest at the time was named Ahimelech who happens to be the father of Abiathar. Abiathar became the high priest shortly after the incident recorded here because Saul killed Ahimelech. And so, in a sense, Jesus is appealing to what was broadly the time of Abiathar, even that was just prior to Abiathar becoming the high priest. So, David shows up. He's on the run. They don't have provisions. They need something to eat. He bangs on the door, you know, of, of Ahimelech and says, hey, you got anything in the fridge? You know, and Ahimelech says, sorry, man, you caught me, you know, I have nothing, the stores are closed. And David says, well, you got to have something. How about that bread in the temple there or in the tabernacle? Now, I don't know how much of a conversation they had. The Old Testament doesn't tell us, but the long and short of it is Ahimelech got the bread right out of the tabernacle, gave it to David, and David gave it to him, his men, and they ate and got some sustenance, and off they went into the sunset, which violated the law, not just the law of the rabbis, the law of Moses, you see, because at this point, only the priests were supposed to 
eat the showbread, the display bread is the idea. I know most of you learned this in Sunday school, but just a quick refresher course on the tabernacle. It's a tent kind of building. The innermost sanctuary was called the Holy of Holies. It was a cubical room and within it was the Ark of the Covenant. Within the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments. And it was lost in Egypt and Indiana Jones found it. You know all that story. So that's the Ark of the Covenant and that's the Holy of Holies. Well, there was very restricted access to that Holy of Holies. Only the high priest went in only once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Outside this heavy veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the so-called Holy Place were three items of furniture. The first of which was called the Altar of Incense. So the high priest would go in every day and tend the altar of incense, and there was always a kind of perfume in the air. As you approached the tabernacle, you would smell this incense. It was, by the way, a unique recipe. It was illegal to burn this flavor of incense anywhere except at the tabernacle. There was supposed to be a unique aroma associated with worship that you wouldn't experience anywhere else. It's part of the very multi-dimensional way in which worship is understood in the Old Testament. Incense is tied to the prayers of God's people. The whole Bible celebrates this point again and again. The symbolism is that as we pray, our prayers rise into God's experience as a sweet aroma. And the Old and New Testaments both celebrate this. Maybe you recall the eighth chapter of Revelation, where we hear, you know, the uh, Jesus opened the seventh seal and, and there, was, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. That's about how long it took for the priest to go in and offer this incense, about a half an hour on a daily basis. Then John says he saw seven angels who had seven trumpets. Then he says, I saw another angel who had a golden censer come and stand at the altar, the altar of incense. To him was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. This is tabernacle imagery. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. You see, all of this is, is simply uh, a restatement of what is many times said, incense kind of stands for prayer. But prayer has a couple of pillars upon which it must stand. One is a lampstand. The only light inside this tabernacle was from a lampstand which was fueled by oil, holy oil, the same oil used to anoint people who are standing for God's Spirit. So light must come through God's Spirit. We can only pray intelligibly as we are enlightened by God's Spirit, but also the table of showbread. And so on the other side of the tabernacle was the bread. Bread, of course, universally through the Scripture, standing for the Word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Jesus is the bread that comes down from heaven, the divine logos, the word. And so this idea, the spirit and the word, become the pillars upon which prayer can be properly offered. And it's only through prayer that we gain some kind of proper access into that holy of holies where worship is to be rendered to God. So the tabernacle is a wonderful picture for us of worship generally, of course outside, it's not pictured here, was the laver, water, washing, baptism, and then the brazen altar, sacrifice, bloody sacrifices of, altar, uh, of animals. So you have the crucifixion of Christ, of course, embolized, emblemized there, then baptism, which gives us access into the presence of God, but only as we are illumined by God's Spirit and instructed by His Word so that we can pray in a manner that brings us before God in a proper and intelligent fashion. If you look at this straight from the top, it forms perfectly the sign of the cross. And so the Old Testament has many times through it, hidden here and there, the cross, the thumbprint of Christ, and this is only one of them. Well, here's the table of showbread. It probably looks something like that. Twelve loaves of bread, probably these kind of circular affairs. They stood for the twelve tribes of Israel. The showbread was not food for God. Ancient religions certainly had the notion of bringing God food because it was understood that God got hungry. 
And so you'd have to feed him grain offerings. All of these things were intended to nourish the deity. Animals were brought. If times were really rough, you might bring a human sacrifice to feed the god. That's how ghastly was the perverse kind of expression of pagan religion. There's nothing of that here. God makes it very clear. If I were hungry, he says, I wouldn't tell you, you know. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need to let you in on my needs. But of course, the whole point of that is he has no needs. God is not like the Energizer Bunny who will eventually run down, you know, even though he goes a long time. God never, ever runs out of energy. He has inherent, perpetual, eternal strength, power, almighty goodness in him that needs no fuel. The bread is for us. And so the bread was eaten to, to sort of symbolize this is God giving us what we need, not us giving God what he needs. The priests would eat the bread to tell the people of God that God is feeding all of us through his word and through his spirit. And that was the reason why the bread was not supposed to be eaten by others. Well, David comes along. It was not stated expressly, but commonly understood, and I think it's correct, that David arrived at Nob on the Sabbath. So it was the day when the old bread was going to be pulled out and new fresh bread was going to be put in the tabernacle, you see. So it was really just before probably Ahimelech and those with him would have eaten the bread that David shows up and says, hey, how about you give that bread to us? And so that was the, probably the timing of this whole thing. What David does at this point and what Jesus, in a sense, is appealing to David to establish is that ceremonial law, even from Moses, must be made subservient to the law of human welfare, human well-being. We don't put people to death to keep rituals alive, you see. That there is a balance that must be maintained between what is of ultimate importance and what is of secondary importance, and on that basis, David was perfectly happy having the priest violate a technical law for the sake of a more important principle. It's generally understood that what Jesus is doing at this point is appealing to David not as an exception to the rule, but as a precedent by which to understand the rule. And that's where the Pharisees had messed up, because they were flipping this interpretive scheme over and making the lesser rule overrule the greater. And so Jesus appeals to David to establish that point. He terminates this little conversation with some dramatic words, very familiar. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath in the Jewish scheme, in the Jewish world, was understood, first of all, was supposed to be a principle of liberty, not tyranny. It had become tyrannical. It had become almost impossible for a well-intentioned Jewish people to navigate the labyrinth of rules on the Sabbath and not make a mistake somewhere. There was no liberty to it. Even the interpreters of the Old Testament really understood that. It was a distortion even of how the Jewish people had properly understood it. Another Midrash says, quote, This implies that we should disregard one Sabbath for the sake of saving the life of a person so that that person may be able to observe many Sabbaths. They already understood a kind of greater good ethic at work here, but in the case of the Pharisees conversing with Jesus, that principle had apparently been lost. The Sabbath was supposed to be a principle of health, not harm. It was supposed to be something that does us good, not tying us up in knots, leaving us with this feeling of complete paralysis, wondering if we've violated some arcane point. The Old Testament, uh, Exodus 31, construing the Sabbath rule, says, it's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Well, as we were saying, God doesn't need to rest and God doesn't need to be refreshed, does he? It was a paradigm for us. We're the ones that need rest. We're the ones that need refreshment. And even in the creation week, God is already doing this for our benefit, putting in place something that will do us good. Health, not harm. It was a principle of trust, but not presumption. 
I know some of you in this room, as I have at times in my life, lived by the uh, revenue stream of billable hours, you know. And I'm going to tell you, more than once, when I was practicing law, I had a little temptation to run into the office and bill a couple of hours. Make sure I could make it to the end of the month with black ink, you know. And it takes a little bit of trust, a little bit of faith, to actually take a day off. We have this sort of strange idea that all the eco you know, economic reality of the universe depends on me working. And sometimes that work seems to be appealing to me on the, on the day of rest. It takes faith to take a day off. It takes trust to believe that God is going to care for you even if you're not out there, you know, cranking the crank. Especially during harvest time. In agrarian societies, you know that harvest has to take place in a fairly limited window. And there's a huge, huge pressure, even on the Sabbath, to run out and do the harvesting because there's not much time to get it done. It was illegal to do that in ancient Israel. This was a question of trusting God. But trust is not supposed to translate into presumption, testing God, going beyond what is rational. There's a very interesting story told by the historian Dio Cassius, who says, quote, Pompey could never have taken Jerusalem, but that the religious Jews refused to defend themselves on the Sabbath, which when he observed, he then on that day most fiercely assaulted them and took their city. You know, Pompey came through in his eastern campaign. He defeated Mitridates up in the region of Cappadocia. He comes down, finds Jerusalem in a civil war. He tells John Hyrcanus II, who's got Jerusalem under siege, that if John will more or less tip his hat to Rome, Pompey will help him. But Pompey realizes Jerusalem is a pretty tough nut to crack. It's a well-provisioned, well-defended city. But Pompey also notices that every, Sun or every Saturday these folks just kind of went to sleep. So Pompey thought, that's it. I'll go after him on this, and he did. And they would not defend themselves, and Jerusalem fell to Rome on a Sabbath day because they refused to fight. Well, Dio Cassius here is saying there's a point where trusting God becomes presumption, that maybe that was a day when human welfare should have overruled the ceremonial restriction. You know, I'll leave that to your own uh, um, estimates. But uh, anyway, Jesus concludes this, therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. This, of course, is Jesus once again identifying himself as the Son of Man. Going back to Daniel chapter 7, this rather divine character who comes to the Ancient of Days, who's given a kingdom who will not end, and this now becomes one of the most stunning statements in all the New Testament. When Jesus says, clearly referring to himself, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, it would be hard to imagine anything to which Jesus could appeal that would, dis, that would indicate or give evidence of greater authority. This is virtually a claim to deity. There's really no other way to construe it. It once again is one of those multiple occasions in the Gospel of Mark where we see the deity of Christ just beneath the surface. And I think we see it on virtually every page. The only way to reasonably construe what's just been said here is to see Christ not simply as a great man, even a perfect man, but as nothing less than God among us in human form. Your Greek lesson for the day looks a little daunting, but don't, uh, don't panic. The first word, hosta, hosta, adverb, so that, kurios, Lord, estin, he is, hoquios, to anthropo. You're following that, aren't you? It's easy. The Son of Man is Lord, and then Kai to Sabatu, even of the Sabbath. And it's a remarkable statement, and it must have felt like a nuclear explosion to those who heard Jesus say it. Well, you know that in Christian history, the Sabbath has been a somewhat controversial question. And Christian people in good conscience, have taken a very wide view, uh, you know, perspectives on the Sabbath. Some have been very, very conservative and restrictive. The movie, um, Chariots of Fire, 
What? That whole movie turned on the axis of an elite runner who wouldn't run on the Sabbath. You know that story. We also, I'm aware, of professional athletes who hold themselves out, quite outspoken, robust Christian people who have no hesitation whatsoever to claim that they have faith in Christ, and they go out and play football, professional sports, on the Sabbath, and we sit home and watch them. Now, there's a little distance between those two, theory, those two views. You'll grant that, won't you? And I don't want you to think at this point that I'm going to try to resolve that. I think a lot of personal conscience has to go into it, but I would like to offer at least a thought or two in the spirit of a Sunday school lesson this morning about how we not should view the ancient practice of Sabbath in Israel, although I hope that's been instructive to us, but maybe how we can ourselves think about it. Uh, so I'm going to start with the Westminster Confession. Uh, the granddaddy, really, of Reformed confessional statements, the most important one in Presbyterian history, uh, says at chapter 27, ver uh, uh, paragraph 7, quote, As it is the law of nature that in general a due proportion of time be set apart for the worship of God, so in his word, by a positive, moral, and perpetual commandment binding on all men in all ages, he has particularly appointed one day in seven for a Sabbath, to be kept holy unto him, which from the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ was the last day of the week, and from the resurrection of Christ was changed to the first day of the week, which in Scripture is called the Lord's Day, and is to be continued to the end of the world as the Christian Sabbath. So this is the classical view of Sunday, Sabbath, Christian Sabbath, and certainly there's a strong implication here that it's to be a day quite distinctly different from the other days of the week. The next paragraph says, quote, this Sabbath is to be kept holy unto the Lord when men, after a due preparation of their hearts and ordering of their common affairs beforehand, not only observe and holy rest all the day from their own works, words, and thoughts about their worldly employments and recreations, to wit, billable hours, but also are taken up the whole time in the public and private exercises of his worship and in the duties of necessity and mercy. This is a little different than the ancient Jewish view. It was a day of uh, unmitigated rest, as we've already seen. The, the Westminster takes a different view and really gets its inspira inspiration from Christ himself, who says it is, good, it is right to do good on the Sabbath, to do good, to work, and sometimes work hard, but just not do the regular work of the rest of the week, you see. And so the Westminster, while it's establishing a pretty firm rule here that the Sabbath should be a day set aside as holy, is not necessarily tying us down to a day of inactivity. All right, here's a few thoughts. This is in the spirit of for whatever you think it's worth, all right? So I'm not, so I'm not trying to be dogmatic. I just want to give you some food for thought about this. When we look at the New Testament, we certainly see that the Sabbath is re-engineered by Christ. All the Ten Commandments are repeated virtually verbatim in the New Testament. Every one of them is restated and in times ramped up in the New Testament with the single exception of the Fourth Commandment. It is never restated and given to God's people as a rule of life in the way that the other ones are. However, the Fourth Commandment is never specifically abrogated in the New Testament. We have abrogation of laws, dietary regulations. Christians don't observe kosher. All of the Jewish holidays, those are abrogated. Various uh, other practices and so on, sacrificial offerings with animals and so on, all of it abrogated. You see, the New Testament sets aside a fair amount of what was practiced in the Old Testament. That also never happens with respect to the Sabbath. So somewhere in the middle is how we are to understand this question. I think it's fairly easy to see that what Jesus did was reshape the Sabbath from a day of holy inactiv inactivity to a day of robust activity, just not the normal routine of the rest of the week. It retains a healthy rhythm in life, but it also includes a kind of refreshing and clarifying of the greater purpose of life. And so it has that healthy kind of significance for us. A Sunday Sabbath in the New Testament is certainly implied, but never mandated. 
I think the Westminster, although I love that document, is a little bit stronger than it has warrant to be. I say that with all modesty, believe me, because those were geniuses who wrote that document. But the fact of the matter is, you will look in vain in the New Testament for an actual mandate, worship on Sundays. What we do have is a clear indication that the church at least was never mentioned as worshiping on Saturday. We don't have any precedent along those lines. And in fact, we have at least some subtle warning against it. So Paul writes to the Colossians, a church that was being pressured by a very Jewish influence to become more Jewish in its practice. And Paul says this, let no one judge you in food or drink, kosher, regarding festivals or new moons or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So at least at a certain level here, we find there's actually a little distance that's being introduced with respect to the Jewish practice of a seventh-day Sabbath. We have no express mandate in the New Testament that the church should worship on Sunday. It never says, thou shalt worship on Sunday, or anything to that. It is implied, though. So, Jesus rose on the first day of the week. That's been the proof par excellence. You know, this is the beginning of a new age in Christ. Paul says to the Corinthians, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've also given orders to the churches in Galatia, so you must do on the first day of the week, Let each of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. So at least something was happening on the first day of the week, impliedly. We have the reference in in Revelation to the Lord's Day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, universally taken to be the first day of the week, and I heard behind me a loud voice. So the point is, we look at the New Testament, and we see that, if anything, there's a pretty solid hint in direction of Sunday, and yet it stops short of actually mandating Sunday. I think, I, I think that's a fair assessment. The church, early in her history, nevertheless, elected to meet on Sunday, partly because it was hinted at in the New Testament, partly because you've got to meet some day of the week, you know, I mean, we had to agree on some day. If we're going to meet corporately, if we're going to be engaged as a community in worship, then this cannot be anarchy. We have to say, okay, everybody, let's do it on Sunday. You know, and so there's a, a matter of practical, prudential kind of concern here, just so we all march to the same drummer. Sunday seemed to be a pretty good day for that reason. And of course, the church early in her history was seeking to distinguish herself as being something than simply a sect of Judaism. The church felt free to take Sunday as a day of worship, a kind of Christian Sabbath, so that she wouldn't simply be indistinguishable from earlier Judaism. Now, some people have said, and I've seen this in print, uh, especially those who represent Seventh-day worshipers, Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Baptists, there are certain others that, of course, a minority who have insisted we're violating God's rule, we should be worshiping on Saturday. And the argument I've heard many times, and maybe you've seen it too, is this was something the Pope forced on Christian people way back then when the church was corrupt, and now we've just sort of like uh, sheep followed that rule. That is not true. Okay, I just let me say that. I, I don't have another hour to justify that. It is simply not true. This was adopted before the Pope ever looked like anything, uh, something resembling the Pope today. This was a decision made by the community of Christian people, and many Jewish people continue to worship on Saturday anyway. That's why we have a kind of common idea of a Saturday-Sunday weekend. Both days came down, but in the Gentile world, it was simply as a matter of kind of common uh, consensus that Sunday would be the day. Believe me, if this was something that had been simply cooked up, you know, by the Pope, there's been enough questions raised by the Reformers and others. Virtually every generation of Christians have revisited these issues. And trust me, it would have been um, examined as well. The Reformers had no problem setting aside what they saw as abuses of the Pope. They all come out unanimously and emphatically that worshiping on Sunday is a perfectly appropriate thing for Christian people to do. Having examined that question closely, meticulously, and believe me, the question has, continues to be examined. So I, I think that sort of uh, very superficial dismissal of the whole business of worshiping on Sunday needs to be taken not too seriously. Finally, sorry, I'm about 30 seconds over here.
the New Testament ties Sabbath to rest in Christ. I think this is the most important point. I mentioned Hebrews chapter 4 earlier. It was written against the backdrop of Jewish expectation that the new age coming in Messiah would be, a day, would be perpetual rest. What Hebrews chapter 4 seems to be saying is that that is realized in Christ. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, referring to the old covenant people and their seventh-day observances. Although my works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from his works. But again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. And he continues saying, There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. He who is in Christ has entered his rest. And in Hebrews 4, it is specifically said to be today. There is a sense in which Christian people wake up every day you roll out about every day and you say to God, thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for another day in which I have now realized the rest that is only available in Christ. And in some ways, the Christian says every day of the week is a holy day. But as a matter of practical convenience, we've set aside one of them. Sunday seemed like a pretty good choice and made it for corporate purposes and for special purposes of charity, a day that would be nevertheless set apart and distinguished beyond the sense in which those others are all to be regarded as Sabbath. Now, I don't know how that sets with you. This is at least some food for thought. That's what I'm giving it to you as, and I hope that uh, is helpful. Bottom line, however, never let rules of religion become a straitjacket that ties you up. Let them rather be the facilitators of liberty and service in the name of Christ. I think that at least is one lesson we should get from this text.